Hi, this is Dr. Dan Jemmy. I'm a chiropractic physician in North Carolina, and I've developed a system of uh, te teaching and treating um, athletes and different types of health ailments in people and my patients called Systems Healthcare. It's basically a technique devised to figure out what's going on with a person and how to fix it in the most, most natural and holistic ways. We use uh, manual therapy techniques. We use diagnos a diagnosis system of applied kinesiology techniques and manual muscle testing. So we look at uh, different ways to challenge the body. We look at different ways to evaluate human function, both physically, uh, structurally, as well as chemically and nutritionally, and sometimes even emotionally. We're evaluating the entire nervous system to, to see what's going on with a person, see where their health ailments are coming from, see why they may have certain symptoms, and how to go about best treating them. So treating the actual cause, figuring out where the primary issue is when, uh, when evaluating a, a patient who comes into our office and how to go best about uh, fixing it, whether they need nutritional therapies, whether they perhaps need uh, lifestyle modifications or manual therapy techniques, which I'm going to show in a little bit on a patient that we have here. I'm teaching a group of students right now in St. Louis my technique. So systems healthcare is basically looking and, and uh, using and understanding that our body develops compensations when, we're, when we have a certain ailment. So if you have, say, a digestive problem, you're going to develop certain compensatory problems and you're going to have symptoms related to that too. Likewise, if you got into some sort of injury, like say you sprained an ankle or you hurt your back, whatever the injury may be, even if that just happened out of nowhere, like you woke up one day and your back started hurting or say you got into some traumatic accident, no matter what the ailment or injury may be, your body is going to now develop compensatory patterns to try and deal with that problem as well as you're obviously going to develop some symptoms. So systems healthcare is meant to help the physician sort of sort through those true problems, those actual primary problems that truly need to be treated while dealing with the compensatory issues that sort of act like smoke screens uh, that the patient is you know, having issues with that, that, that uh, sort of uh, mask other problems that, that need to be treated as well as uh, uh, you might say make it look like simply put like make it look like something sh should be treated when it really shouldn't be in other words we often see secondary issues when we um, when we're treating someone and there's indications that there's a that there's a problem but we don't necessarily want to be treating those problems and based off that many people develop a lot of symptoms and the symptoms are often not where the true problem is so there's a, there's a unique system on how to go about treating the person, realizing when a problem is primary, secondary, tertiary, and, and so on, and understanding where their symptoms are coming from. Should you be treating certain symptoms at a time? Or is it part of the overall picture? Or are, there, or are those symptoms merely a reflection of another problem going on or going awry somewhere else in their body? So we're able to basically unravel a person, figure out the true cause of what's going on with them, and also how things are interconnected when, some, when, when someone has a health ailment. So if someone has, say, a knee pain, that might be related to their digestive problem, or it might be related to fatigue or something like that. Maybe they're having energy problems and they have uh, some adrenal gland dysfunctions. They don't sleep well, or maybe you don't sleep well, you wake up often throughout the night, uh, and that's due to, or maybe said a better way, that's also causing you not to heal well and you have some inflammatory conditions and therefore you have headaches and back pain and digestive problems and a lot of people have a lot of little daily nagging or daily symptoms that are just sort of nagging problems that come and go or perhaps get worse as they get older or are attributed to being old. But we can actually relate these health symptoms uh, to one another and understand where they're actually coming from and how to best go about treating them at the source. So I'd like to show you uh, some general techniques that we use in the office, figuring out how to um, evaluate a patient. So applied kinesiology and therefore systems healthcare is really, in a, it's a diagnostic evaluation to begin with. So it's basically a form of biofeedback where we're providing a, um, like a, an input into the body and looking for a muscle response. We're doing a, basically muscle testing to look for a motor output. So we have uh, perhaps a patient look at certain areas like you know look into the distance which tends to be like if you're sympath sympathetically stressed out or look at our nose which would be more like parasympathetic relaxation sometimes we have a patient do a, an olfactory challenge which would be smelling something or a, a gustory ch a challenge if they've tasted something you might be aware like if you uh, you know you taste something sweet 
it could balance your blood sugar right away, even before it gets into your body. Or you might smell something, it could make you nauseous. This is how you know, these certain smells and tastes interact with our brain. So we can do these challenging, especially a therapeutic touch type of challenge. We have certain reflexes throughout our body, as well as acupuncture, acupuncture and acupressure points that many people are familiar with. But other certain reflexes and, 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 and nerve points and spinal points and muscle points that we can use to diagnose what's going on with a person, what is wrong with them, and use this uh, source of biofeedback to then see a motor output response so we can see a change in muscle function. So we get into muscle testing. A lot of people are, are very unfamiliar with muscle testing or they've had some maybe unfortunately bad experience with muscle testing or watched one of those YouTube videos where someone's like trying to guess the number in their hat of someone, someone's uh, like a psychic reading. But muscle testing is is a really way to evaluate our nervous system and our nervous system integrates everything within our body of course and therefore we can use certain patterns in systems healthcare we're looking for various patterns that are working properly as well as patterns that are not working as well as they should to give us clues as to what may be working correctly as well as incorrectly with the patient and therefore go about fixing it in which we believe, believe is a, or, or see to be a, a, the most optimum way in a truly uh, natural manner. So muscles are always turning on and turning off to some degree, realize that. If we have uh, Dr. Anderson here helping us out today, don't stand up just yet. He's always very excited. So if he raises an arm like this, his biceps are going to turn on and the triceps are going to turn off. Now what we mean by that is, that doesn't mean when, when a muscle turns off or actually inhibits, neurologically inhibits, or turning on, we use the, the correct term of, of, facil of facilitation. So when a muscle actually fires or facilitates, the muscle is just basically becoming more active. Likewise, when the muscle inhibits or turns itself down a little bit, it doesn't mean that the muscle is no longer working. So it just means that the muscle is not functioning to that higher state of, uh, of integrity that it was initially. So this allows us to flow properly. This is what creates mobility and stability and flexibility and allows us to move as well as we, as we should be moving. But we're also looking, eventually we're, we're gonna see when I, when I treat him after we do this gait test, we're going to see how muscles are also integrated with certain areas of our body. So we have certain muscles in our body that are more related to uh, certain organs than other ones. In, in, in other words, our knee muscles, the muscles surrounding our knees, like our adductor muscles and my thigh muscles and, and my upper calf muscles here, they tend to be related to more endocrine dysfunctions, especially adrenal gland issues. And we also know that the muscles of the abdomen here tend to be more related to uh, small intestine and digestive issues. So we look for muscle imbalances and certain patterns of these muscle imbalances that, that then provide us more diagnostic information to how certain organs are functioning and how there may be a connection to a visceral issue, such as a digestive problem, to perhaps a musculoskeletal issue. A lot of people will have pain, they'll have dysfunction, they'll have poor range of motion, they'll have mobility issues because of something that they ate, a digestive problem, perhaps an emotional response, a nutritional uh, uh, imbalance, say deficiency, or sometimes excess if you're taking something you shouldn't be. You could have a hormonal imbalance, maybe someone's taking too much thyroid medication. Maybe a woman is estrogen dominant at certain times of the month and she's having PMS and this is what's causing her to have back pain or lower belly pain or breast tenderness or headaches due to the imbalance of estrogen and progesterone in her body. So you, you know, probably familiar with how these things, or, may, or I should say you may not be familiar with how these things work, but you realize that there's symptoms associated with hormonal imbalances or nutrient imbalances causing physical symptoms. Another simplistic uh, example is if someone has a low blood sugar problem, they might get headaches from that, or you might get headaches from that, or they get jittery. Maybe they're, uh, they're fine tuning the, dexter the dexterity of their hands, there's no longer uh, functioning as well as they should. You know, you don't have that, that fluid handwriting anymore due to how your blood sugar is influencing uh, certain muscles and certain um, aspects of your, uh, your musculoskeletal system and your nervous system. So when we get into gait testing, it's, uh, evaluating someone's gait is, is good for two reasons. One, it lets us know if their gait is working as a, as a, a, normal, um, a normal state. In other words, muscles are facilitating turning on and inhibiting uh, turning off as they should be. And it also gives us uh, a general idea as to 
the balance of facilitation and inhibition of these certain muscles that we're testing while the person is in a standing position. In other words, we can to some degree evaluate their foot, knee, ankle, these weight-bearing muscles that they're putting more pressure into as they're walking, running, or moving in an upright position. Okay, so I'm going to show you a, uh, a standard gait test so you can understand how muscles are, are always normally and naturally turning on and turning off in a normally functioning body. And this is how, again, we move. So, again, muscle testing, it's, it's not anything weird. It's, a, it's really a source of biofeedback that we use as a therapist, as a physician, to evaluate. Muscle testing is, is not by itself a way to fully diagnose a problem with some with something that's going on with someone. You, you would never use muscle testing to say, oh, you know, you have uh, you have this disease or you have this ailment. It's used in conjunction with the a thorough he health history of a person. It's used in conjunction with laboratory tests and, and things like that. So, but we can use muscle testing to understand so much more about what's going on with the human body. And in this case, so Dr. Todd here has a recent injury with his foot. Do you want to tell him quickly what happened? Uh, well, I've had chronic ankle sprains before. Um, Speak right to the camera. <laughs> Go ahead. And so basically <laughs> somebody just rolled into the side of it, and then it's a lot worse. That was about a month ago. So, so what, what hurts to do right now? Um, calcaneal eversion and uh, squatting. Okay. Can thing. you show them? Can you see that on the film? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so right, right there for sure. And that hurts how bad on a scale of 1 to 10? Um, as far as I take it, probably a 4, and then I could probably take it further in. Okay. And can you show your dorsiflexion, how much you can flex your ankle? And that's not what you can usually do, right? No. Yeah. That's definitely limited. And how about the other way so they can see the normal foot? Is that much difference? It's about the same. Yeah, it's about the same. So we really Maybe it just hurts. That. So it hurts so more. It hurts more when you do that? Yeah on the right, yeah. but it's about the same, it looks about the same. Okay, so let's show a, a, a gait test here. We're gonna use this latissimus muscle here, his lat, and he's gonna resist against me. And that muscle is what we call facilitated or strong. Now when he steps forward on his right leg, a normal step forward, so there you go, normal step. So now obviously what happens here is when he steps forward, the anterior muscles, his thigh muscles, everything on the lower body, those, those muscles are firing and then the anterior muscles on the upper body are also firing. In an exaggerated sense, that's how you would walk. I know it seems like a swagger right now, but the opposite flexors would turn on in sort of these quadrants. Likewise, as these muscles in the back, his hamstring is now firing on the left leg, therefore his upper body extensors also on the right side should be firing too. So if my flexors are firing here, then my extensors are firing this way. Kind of like if I was rotating, even though you're not going to do that when you walk or run, but to some degree, that's how you're moving. So my right leg's forward here, like his. Our quads are firing, our rectus are firing, all these muscles in the anterior front part of the leg are firing. And then our upper body, uh, also, our, our upper body flexors are also facilitated. So that means that in this case, the upper body extensors, the muscle here in the back, should turn off like they do right now. So now this muscle actually turns off. He puts his feet together again. So his bicep here, if we take his this bicep here and push hard as you can. So that muscle's working very well. If I take, say, one of his pec muscles, push hard, and that's also working very well. It's considered a normal muscle test. He steps forward with his right leg again. And now, again, as these fire, these fire on this side, the flexors on this side should normally be off. So he pushes up, and that muscle turns off. That's a normal response. That's what should happen, okay? And if he switches his legs, so now again the flexors here are firing, therefore the flexors on this side would also be firing, and those muscles, push hard, should work just like that. They should work properly. So let's go back to that right leg forward again. So what we're going to see here, here he is in this normal gait, and this turns off, okay? And this turns off like it should. Therefore this muscle here is firing, right? Because the extensors on the back side of the right body here should be firing. And the flexors on this side, like his bicep, because if these are firing, then these should be firing, that turns on. But what I'm gonna have him do is just rock back and forth on that foot. Like, let's do that just like three times to basically irritate that foot that he has injured. Now sometimes just putting someone in the gait position if their foot is 
bad enough. I'm not saying his isn't, but sometimes it'll be enough to throw the gate off. But now, pull hard. What's happening now is that the muscle is actually over-firing here. So it's enough to drive his nervous system into like this heightened state of awareness where that irritation from the foot, most likely, of course it could be something in his knee too, but we're assuming it's from his foot, even though we haven't evaluated it anymore right now, that it's enough to create this like over-sympathetic type of, of uh, nervous system input where it's causing this muscle to now overfire. And how long will it last? Hard to say, but not that long. In about 30 or 40 seconds since I was talking right now. So let's have you do it a couple more times. Just let's just even do it twice, where he's just irritating that injury. And again, I can take this muscle over here that should be off, and now that's actually firing. Okay. Let's see what happens. Do it again a couple more times, and we'll see what happens to this lat over here. So that's still working, but see what happens is now actually all these muscles that should be turning off right now are actually turning on. So you can put yourself back to neutral there. So what's happening is his body is in like this protective mechanism and every time he puts some force into that foot, into the ankle that he injured, all his muscles are, in a general sense you could, be, you could say they're becoming tight or protected or we could use the word like over facilitated. It's like his body is in this guarded position where it's affecting so many of the other muscles. Now this is a problem for many reasons, a couple off the top of my head you can think of is, or I can think of is that one is you're always walking on that foot. I mean, you have to be. He's mobile. He's, he's, he's going to be using that foot, of course, just to get around. And that's going to, in turn, often create many other problems. This is how people eventually, or, or you could always probably say, they develop some compensatory problem that results in an injury, even if the injury appears to be resolved later on in life. In other words, he, he, this thing eventually heals up, hopefully, let's say it heals up to him 100%, which would mean he still has, he gets full function back, the range of motion comes back, the pain's gone, but all of a sudden in, say, maybe a month or two months or maybe even next year, all of a sudden this shoulder starts hurting or maybe his hip starts hurting or maybe his knee starts hurting, and even though the pain in the foot is gone, it's altered his gait mechanics to some degree because we didn't fix the actual injury pattern that developed from that injury, and now he develops all these compensatory issues and these muscle imbalances, and over the years, or over the months maybe, he just winds himself up, and now muscles that should be used to a certain degree are not being used properly, and other muscles that are, are, are meant to not be used as often during certain positions are being used more. In other words, muscles are having to be taxed more when they shouldn't be, and other muscles are not, being, are not being taxed when they need to be. So you get these mobility and stability issues, and next thing you know, you develop a new problem that was really a resultant of the original injury. And this is how injuries can come back to haunt us if we truly don't go about fixing them, and it gives explanation to why all of a sudden someone's like, hey, you know, I have this new injury, I don't know where it happened, why it happened, because just because the pain in the original injury was gone doesn't necessarily mean that the function, the full function, and the actual injury was corrected and restored at that time. So we have a general gait test here and we've got some pain, he's got some pain in the foot that we can use to go by and we now also have a gait imbalance that we can see his gait becomes, uh, his, his gait becomes an issue, it becomes, um, it's, a, it's a dysfunctional gait, so he, he has a, a gait dysfunctional issue whenever he puts weight on that right leg which would happen, you know, hundreds of thousands of times a day. And we can use this test to check our progress once we're done working through this injury pattern, which I'm going to show you next. Okay, so we're going to evaluate, I'm going to evaluate um, some of Dr. Anderson's foot and ankle muscles here to get an idea of what's working and what is not uh, related to his injury. So. I'm going to check some muscles here. So this one, you can see here when I push outward on his foot, that's a test for the, uh, well, where a lot of people get like posterior shin splints and muscles related to plantar fasciitis, that sort of thing. It's his tibialis posterior muscle. He actually can't resist against me there. So if I check the one on his left hand side here, push hard as you can here, touch. that one locks. I'll try and make sure you get it seen in the camera. Good. Can you see that okay? Yeah? As opposed to this one? Okay, big difference. Does it hurt? No, just, I just can't do it. Yeah, there's nothing there. Okay. 
So we'll do this one here, like a dorsiflexion test. We'll curl your toes down, and he's going to push his foot up towards his knee. And that's strong. And let's bend here. This is a test for his calf. He keeps his foot up like this. Pull hard. Try hard as you can. And that one's also weak, and he pushes or points his foot down. I pull from behind his toes. These are calf muscles. Sometimes these really shut off pretty significantly. You know, the muscles weakening is a, is a protective mechanism to some point to the foot and ankle because these muscles are strained, they're injured, and, and the body compensates to try and heal them up and to allow the muscle to recover properly. But unfortunately, some of these muscles, or sometimes all of them, will not turn on, and the problem just gets worse and worse and worse. Or as I was saying, when he was in the gait position, he creates new compensations as, this, as these foot and ankle muscles, calf muscles don't fire. Next thing you know, he starts favoring the left leg more and then his left knee hurts as his left ankle or his left hip or something like that. That's why you know, we can give reason to why something all of a sudden hurts due to an old injury. Um, again, that might not have been corrected even though the pain tends to go away over time, sometimes. So if he pulls here, it's also weak. So I've got a couple calf muscles here, his gastroc and his soleus, the upper and lower part of his calf, as well as his uh, tibialis posterior, that muscle that really helps a lot with pronation when you, when you walk and run. And on the left side here, pull hard. That one's really strong and he points down. This one's actually weak too. So he does have a soleus problem, a, a plantar flexion issue there on the left as well as the right. So I've got muscle here on that left side, the, the normal side or the, the side that he's not having a problem with as well as a few on the right. Check a couple of muscles of his hip here, this TFL. I knew that was weak because we checked it earlier. And here, that one's weak too. So these are his hip flexor muscles. He holds his legs straight up like this, just a general rectus test, his thigh. Those seem to be working okay. So I'm going to start by going through the system's healthcare protocol by using this weak muscle, and I'm going to see how it responds when I challenge the muscle a certain way. I'm, I'm activating part of the muscle here that then should turn this on. It should fire the muscle. And when that doesn't happen, then I know that I'm looking at an injury pattern, and I have to go through our protocol to see why his body is not properly addressing that injury. In other words, you could look at it almost like his body is unaware that that injury needs to be corrected, or it's not doing it as fast as we'd like it to do. So in that same position, I come here. And this is just the systems healthcare protocol that we developed, or I developed, and over the years modified to figure out what's the fastest, easiest, and sometimes not so easy, but the easiest and most direct course to uh, figuring out why someone has injury patterns and how to go, best, go about best treating them. So when I compress here in the foot and I extend that opposite foot, these are certain patterns that should turn this muscle on. Let's find this spot here. Have it up again. This takes too long, we're gonna to have to cut the video until I find it. Okay, let's cut for a second. Okay, we're back because sometimes injuries are kind of like a needle on a haystack and I didn't wanna eat up a bunch of film time here uh, trying to find out or, or figure out where the injury is. But now we have it in, and the, the injury actually correlates back to, he recently had, your head injury was how long ago? Uh, that was like a month ago. He had a head injury also uh, along with this foot issue kind of different times, but we can see how these injuries are related to one another and your body will not sometimes heal up an injury, whether that's an old injury or a more new, perhaps acute injury, because an old injury is still lingering around. So he had like concussion type symptoms a month or so ago at a flag football game, clearly a contact flag football game. So what we can see here is, and this is really cool I think, because you can see how an injury somewhere else in the body can affect a, a place distance. In other words, in this case, you'll see here's his weak calf muscle obviously affecting the function of his foot. And if I rub, I'm rubbing behind his neck here, the very lower part of his cervicals, right around the lower part of his cervical spine. And if I rub there and push, put a little pressure in that spine, pull hard now, that muscle strengthens. And it'll last usually for a few seconds, we'll see. Let's try again now. It's already weak, okay? And you can see the difference. I barely have to pull here. Actually, you can put your hand right there. You. Yes. So right on that same spot. Make sure your fingertips are on the spine like mine works. I think there's a disc issue in there. 
and then you'll pull as hard as you can. And that's how much it turns on. And move your hands a little bit off that area now. That's how specific we have to be with these injuries. And you can see the change in the muscle function. And also, now sit up. What happens is we end up digging up old injuries that a person is, again, still having an issue with. And are you, are you having any head or neck problems right now? Uh, I don't notice any. So he doesn't notice any, but for a while you did. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But he's, he's, even though he's not symptomatic, clearly this area of his lower neck is still affecting some other injury. And even though the ankle injury, you re-injured this just recently, the ankle? Uh, no, that, the re-injury pretty much happened a month ago. Okay. It just hasn't been worked on. It hasn't been worked on. But this is now affecting that ankle from healing up. So if I have him turn his head back like this and I check, check his neck extensor muscles, push hard as you can. These are really powerful muscles. He actually can't even resist against that. It's, does it hurt? No. No. It's just annoying. It's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So we can see how weak these muscles are where he can't resist them against them at all. So we're going to come back to that. But for right now, you're going to lie on your back again. Okay. Can you see me up here in the camera? Okay. So it's going to be hard to show you exactly what I'm doing. But basically, I'm doing a, bit, a, little, a little bit of myofascial release, origin insertion, like trigger point work to that lower cervical to the paraspinal muscles and the deep fascial connective tissue to that fifth, sixth, maybe even a little bit of like C7 vertebrae area. Tender? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's usually pretty tender. And then we'll see what happens with the neck muscles as well as the foot or the weak calf muscles after that. So this helps to break up adhesions, break up scar tissues helps with lymph flow and blood flow in an area that's been injured. Line up sarcomeres, like little muscle fibers. It also gives the body an awareness that there's an injury there. In a way, sometimes your body's just like, realize that the injury is no longer there and you have to create that, uh, sort of that nervous system response so it starts to address the injury again. Okay, so let's go back. Let's do uh, with your foot or ankle first here. Hold up like that, pull hard. Pull hard as you can. That's pretty strong right now. Sit up and face that way. So we'll go back and see how it affected the neck here. Push back. So that's pretty good on the right. Push here. How's that feel now? Yeah, it's strong. Is it annoying now? No. Push hard. Good. So that turned on the neck extensor muscles along your back. As well as at least this flexion, gastroc dorsiflexion foot muscle here. Okay, so it's still on. Now point your foot down. Didn't affect that one though. That one's still weak. Let's see this other one here. I'll have you put that up just so that you can see on the camera. Hold in like that. So actually that's still weak too. So out of the three weak muscles we have in this lower leg, it only turned the one on. So we'll move on to this one now. Let's see what happens. Okay, we'll come back in a sec. Okay, so we're starting to see a pattern now with his um, concussion injuries, spinal injuries that he had over a month ago that originally just started with the neck pain and then, you know, ended up injuring the foot after that. Not during that injury, but now, correct? Now we see that it's affecting how this injury is healing up. So again, I know I've probably said this several times, but basically the head injury, even though he has no apparent symptoms from that five weeks ago now, four or five weeks ago for the head injury for yeah. the head injury that's originally he couldn't even lift his head off the table now symptoms are pretty much gone but there's still an injury in the cervical area which I just showed as well as the upper dorsal area like in between his shoulder blades that is actually affecting why he's not healing up in this injury that he sustained in his foot after the head injury okay so I want you to sit up and face that way again and what we end up finding here are these muscles in between his shoulder blades here, his rhomboids, pull hard as you can. This is a very, it should be obviously a very solid muscle. He's got, I've got a very short level here, lever here. These are very solid muscles, especially on someone his size, in between his shoulder blade and his spine, the rhomboid muscles that keep your arm and your scapula tucked in, pull hard as you can. And he can't resist that at all. So I found this spot right on his spine. Actually, why don't you turn so people can see. Keep going, keep going. Uh, so your legs are this way? Yeah, so you're facing the camera. Perfect, right there. Right there. Is that good? So they're actually weak on both sides. 
So he can't resist there. I'm going to rub the upper part of his dorsal area here. No change. I'm going to rub a little bit lower. No change. A little bit lower. There it is. Maybe too low here. So I can actually pinpoint right where the problem is. Here, pull hard, right there. If I go a little bit high or a little bit lower, it doesn't affect that at all. If I'm right on that spot, you can see how much that turns on. Okay? So I'm going to have you lie in the belly. Don't lose my spot. Pretty tender. Oh, yeah. So you can actually get to the point where I feel that a little bit of scar tissue, a little bit of swelling right on either side of the spine of the vertebrae there. Especially on the right, yeah? Yeah. So we can really isolate, using Systems Healthcare, we can actually isolate exactly where the injury is to that very precise one or two centimeters sometimes even to know exactly what area of the body needs to be treated. And it has widespread effects, not just in this case to his shoulder blades and his neck, but also to his foot and his foot not healing up. So we're treating an area obviously very distant from where his current injury is, but affecting that injury very significantly. Okay, so uh, sit back up and you can just face the crowd. Hold your arm like this, pull in hard. And we can see that one turned on, pull hard. Pull hard. Good, find your back. Cut the camera. Okay, so we're back and he still has this persistent soleus weakness, the gas drop. Keep your foot up. Pull, keep your foot up. Pull hard. So that one that one fixed pretty quickly after correcting the first injury to the um, to the neck. But he's had this spinal injury and now the little bit of the pause here that we have is I was able to determine that there's even another injury in between the first two that were corrected. So he's going to pull here again and now I'm right at the lower part of his cervical spine and upper part of his dorsal spine. So it's kind of like pull hard here. He has these three layers, one high, one low, and now this one in between where he had this rather significant injury a month or so ago. So. One more time, hopefully, back in here. Again, a new area. It's almost like he sustained a rather significant injury to mid-cervical or from mid-cervical, like C5, down to about T5, like right around his shoulder blade area. So like the mid lower part of his neck, down those uh, next, what, five, six, seven, eight vertebrae, all the way down to like T5 or so. That's where I landed. Oh, really? Right there in the, the back of my head hit. Where, where I am right now? Yeah. Okay, so he's got, he actually landed where I am right now, and I really am surprised because it's not like we planned that. I'm just realizing that right now. So these injuries will often surprise the person, the therapist working on, the doctor working on, because you'll end up finding you know, pertinent information like that or stuff that makes sense. Okay. All right, so we're back up here, point down, pull hard. All right, now the soleus is finally starting to turn on here. Pull hard, 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 hard. Good, pull again. Good. So we're going to go back here. So we have the calf muscles working. Now let's go back and just make sure we can see on the film. Hold in like this. No such luck. Sometimes we fix one injury and it fixes five or six muscles. And sometimes we fix one injury and two injuries and three injuries just to get one muscle on. We just don't know. So we're going to go back in here. Okay. I'm going to hunt down this injury now using the techniques in the systems healthcare protocol. I think this is going to turn out to a lot of upper body issues here. So look down to the left with your eyes. And look up to the left. Good, and look straight. Let's go here, hold your arm like that, and push down. So I'm actually able to figure out another injury here affecting his foot now in his shoulder here. Push down as hard as you can to his lower trap here. Let me have you sit up and face everybody that way. 
We'll check this one first on the other side. He's gonna push back towards me his trap muscle. Very strong, and then over here, this one is not functioning at all. So let me have you turn so your cam max towards the camera again. Not that far towards the camera. There you go. Push back. So I can actually rub just like I was with his spine and find exactly push where that injury is. Okay, right here. I can actually feel this one. It looks feels pretty swollen, pretty tender. Yeah. Yep. I usually do this a little bit longer, but just for the filming, that'll be enough for now. Go ahead and line your, or actually, come to stay back up. Let's check it. Hold there, push back hard. Good, line your back. And back to this right foot. Good, push again. Cool. So what we've seen so far is we've actually gotten these three lower leg muscles here. The two calf muscles, the gastroc and the soleus. That, flex and extend your foot, as well as the main muscle of the lower leg, the tibialis posterior, which is pronation. That's how you normally walk and absorb shock as you move about all day long, walking and running. That those muscles have not been responding properly from the previous injury. So that even though this injury happened after the, the, the spinal injury, the concussion injury to the head, these, the reason these muscles are not healing up or have not been healing up well for him is because of a, of a sort of a a hidden injury, a dormant, you might say, or at least symptomatically dormant uh, injury still to that spinal area, even affecting his trapezius muscle, his rhomboid muscles, his shoulder girdle muscles, as well as his neck extensors. Let's see what's up with these other two muscles that I had off here in his hip. Push hard. Good. Let's push really hard, make sure we get our timing down. Yeah, that's good, that's strong. And push here again. Hard, hard, hard. Good. Push again hard. Okay. So. Let's now check him again in the gait. Okay, so we're back to the standing gait position. Fix the tibialis posterior, two calf muscles, the tensor fascia line of these hip flexor muscles are now working again. And if you noticed, I'm sure you noticed that, I actually did zero therapies to the actual foot or ankle themselves. So this is a perfect example, just couldn't have, couldn't have set it up any better, where the problem is coming from somewhere very distant, an older injury, again, affecting that newer injury. And although doing certain therapies, maybe, you know, icing or rubbing that area, or, you know, some people tape their ankle or use different, you know, type of to local types of therapies, although that might make you feel better or made him feel better while it was, um, or, or in, in the period from injury to now, it actually was never doing anything to truly heal and provide some therapeutic benefit. You know, it's the same reason why when you injure yourself, you, you tend to rub that injury. The mechanical stimulation, the pressure and the, and the force, and even the heat that you use when you rub over something or put deep pressure into an area um, is enough to block pain receptors. That's why we do that. You know, if I, if I punched him right now, which I, I would not, then he would, before hitting me back, he would rub that area because the heat and the mechanical stimulation would help dampen that pain. So we're gonna go back to the gait test. He's gonna start in neutral position where we have this lat that should be strong like it is right now. It's the same exact thing. We can just use this, the muscles that we did before to keep it consistent. And then if you remember, he stood on his right leg, just a normal step now. And the normal response is these muscles should turn off the flexors on the same side that he's forced up. But before they overfired. So the muscles overfired when he went back and forth several times irritating that foot. So we're gonna do that again. Let's do it. Let's make it even worse now. Before we did three times and then two times, now we'll do like five times where you're really like lunging on that foot and really irritating the foot. So really stressing the foot, I should say. Good, you'd be very good at river dance. <laughs> <laughs> now he's gonna pull hard here again. And again, that's weak. That should stay weak like it is. And before that overfired, as did the pec and the long head of the bicep. So the, the foot is no longer altering his gait. Now, that's great, it's a great test for me to see as the clinician that I've corrected things in that foot, in the shoulder and the neck actually I should say, correcting how the muscles in the foot and ankle are functioning, but more importantly is always how is that person feeling. 
So can you tell us, can you show us the, the test now? That we were before? So if you remember before, he was, he was not able to do that much in, uh, inversion with his foot, and he's pretty much rolling on the outside of his ankle now. And before the pain level was a four? <clears throat> yeah, it was a four, and I, there was no way I could get this far before. There's no apprehension. And how's the pain now? I mean, I can barely feel that, okay. <laughs> Maybe like a one or a two when you do that, but... And I wouldn't be able to step on your foot before, I'm sure. No. Yeah, and I wouldn't do that to a normal patient either, just to... <laughs> uh, anyway, so it's about a one. Yeah. About a one, when yeah. you really stress it out. Yeah. And same spot, or it's moved, or... Yeah, so before it was like... Yeah, it was deep here, but now it's like... It's so deep, I can't even hardly pinpoint it. It's kind of like washing away now. Yeah. Yeah. And what was the other one when you when you flexed it? That pain's gone now. Yeah. I don't, there's nothing there. I don't feel. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. So that's a and that's all good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great response and and uh, that's basically the the basic part of systems healthcare when an injury is being affected by another area. Sometimes not. Sometimes we do have to fix local issues. But really figuring out what the primary problem is and addressing the whole body and how our, how our whole body is integrated as one unit and our foot's not going to work well unless our neck works well and our shoulder works well and these, all, all these things work together. And we, you know, some people say, well, we don't isolate joints. You know, if I have someone with an ankle problem, I always check their knee. This is much beyond that because we realize that your knee is connected to your neck and your neck is connected to your opposite foot and all of the fashion, the connective tissue in our body all integrates within one another. So how you hold your head is going to affect how you move your arms, and it's how it's going to affect your gait and how your ankles flex and extend. And all these things have to work in harmony with one another. And it's kind of like the pebble in the shoe, just a little bit off in your gait. If your foot's just a little bit off because you have a, something in your shoe, like a, even just a, a little pebble, then it'll throw your gait off, and next thing you know, maybe your neck hurts. It's just a good uh, understanding of that. And furthermore, as I started earlier in this, um, in this video, Sometimes, or, or I should say often, these problems, if he didn't sustain a direct injury, but say he's all of a sudden just woke up and he's like, I have neck pain or I have shoulder pain or something like that, when these injuries appear to come out of nowhere, someone has pain that just comes out of nowhere, oftentimes it's from something they ate or organ dysfunctions, endocrine problems, thyroid imbalances, hormonal imbalances, um, immune system issues. People who are chronically sick have certain muscle imbalances that then create pain and discomfort and dysfunction in those areas based off how their immune system is functioning. So we can integrate all these things together, not just the structural aspect of the human body, but also the physical and neurological components. So I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something about um, natural health care and especially systems health care. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, thanks for Dr. Anderson for helping out. No problem.